As we've heard, as we begin this week anew, the weekly cycle of reading the Torah with the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible, it's an appropriate time to affirm that it is possible to take the Bible seriously without taking it literally. To believe that it is true and contains truths without being required to believe that every word must be taken on face value as being true. For were this not the case, we would be required to set aside much of what empirical scientific evidence maintains and what we know about our world. <clears throat> We'd have to choose between contrasting perspectives, between science and religion, a choice that I personally do not believe needs to be mutually exclusive. We don't have to choose one or the other. It's possible to hold both to be true because they hold different truths and more importantly, they answer different questions. Nowhere is that more evident or a true or apparent than in the story that we heard today, the story of creation, the opening chapters of the Torah. While there are Jews and rabbis who are very traditional and who try to straddle the conflicting approaches by choosing to accept the Torah literally and to reject scientific teachings and theories, they're often placed in the untenuous position then of having to justify or explain passages in ways which are just illogical or irrational. So in rejecting the need to believe, for example, that serpents once had the power of speech, we can still find truth in the story. We can read it and appreciate the deeper meaning of the eternal human struggle with temptation. Biblical scholar Judy Klitzner puts it this way, quote, she says, I believe that at its core, the Bible's truths are religious and moral. In profound ways, the Bible's truths address the complexities of the human condition. I think her comment is worth repeating to make sure we hear it. She said again, at its core, the Bible's truths are religious and moral. And in profound ways, the Bible's truths address the complexities of the human condition, what it means to be alive. In other words, it comes to teach us profound lessons about life, about its purpose, about why we, were he why we are here, what God expects of us, how to be moral beings, how to live in the universe. In fact, most all of the biblical narratives are open to diverse and compelling interpretations, with many of these commentaries reflecting and telling us something about and sometimes even more about the cultural and intellectual milieu and concerns of the author, author of any particular commentary. Now, a subject of considerable and intense discussion and debate is whether the statement that the world was unformed and void, that it was, as it's referred to, tohu vavohu, what that actually means. When it says, ha'aretaita tohu vavohu, that the earth was unformed and void, it sounds like it was just a primordial matter that's there. So then the question that was debated for centuries by medieval Jewish philosophers is, does it mean then that God created the world out of nothing or out of something? Does it mean that nothing existed prior to God creating the world or was there some material that he used? Now, in considering what is, what came first in the order of creation, I want to tell you and share with you about a debate that took place between a doctor, an engineer, and a lawyer who were trying to decide what came first and therefore which profession came first. So they decided to look at the story of creation to see which would pr prove which of their respective professions was the oldest. So the doctor, who was a surgeon, pointed to the story of God removing a rib from Adam to complete and create his companion Eve and said, this proves that the first profession ever to exist was that of a doctor. After all, God performed surgery. Well, the engineer pointed to the very act of creation itself, to the tohu vavohu, creating the world out of chaos within a week as showing that only an engineer, only a person with an engineer's mind could pull this off, <clears throat> such a remarkable feat, to be able to create the world out of chaos. So truly, the engineer must be the oldest profession, at which point the lawyer responded and said, yeah, but who do you think created the chaos? 
Do we have any lawyers here? <laughs> Hopefully my lawyer is here, okay. It's actually the second week in a row I had a lawyer joke. All right. So for thousands of years, because we have taken the Torah, because we take the Torah seriously, and we want to understand what it is that God wishes to teach us, our sages have poured over each and every word of the text to read it carefully and closely in an effort to better understand the meaning of the eternal wisdom that it contains and what it is that God is trying to tell us. They've argued throughout the ages over the specific meaning of each and every word, even in some instances of every letter as well as the purpose of the story of creation and the meaning behind creation itself. So if the first chapter of Genesis, of the Bible itself, is an introduction to the rest of the entire Bible, what is it telling us? The foremost biblical commentator, Rashi, posits that the Torah opens with the creation story in order to show that since God created the earth, he's entitled to distribute the earth's land as he sees fit. God is the ultimate landlord, and he wanted, therefore, the nations of the world to realize and to accept and recognize the claim of the Jewish people to the land of Israel is found in the very opening verses of the Torah. In fact, it's the, what Ida was referring to when David Ben-Gurion spoke before the Peel Commission in 1937. Well, Maimonides teaches that the purpose of the introductory statements in Genesis are to teach that we are endowed with intellect. And God wants us to use that intellect, our minds, to be able to fulfill the commandment that he gives to Adam, the very first man, to be a partner in creation and to rule over the world. Now, personally, I've always loved the story in the Midrash, to, which understands and explains our purpose on earth. And it re relates actually to what our Benot Mitzvah taught us when they introduced this week's Torah reading. The Midrash says that after God created Adam, the very first human being and the first creature that, who was endowed with intelligence and the ability to speak and to communicate, God took him and showed him all that he had created, all the animals and all the world, all the vegetation. And he told Adam, it's your responsibility now to care for the world because I will not be creating anything after you. Indeed, Adam was created on the sixth day of, and final day of creation. After that, it says God rested. So Adam was created after vegetation, after the trees, after the fish, after birds, after animals, after the world itself. He was at the quintessence, the pinnacle of creation. And the message, therefore, of this Midrash is that it's our responsibility to act as stewards of creation, of stewards of the world, of all that came before us. So while there are multiple, many, many messages inherent and embedded in today's Torah portion, many ways to interpret and understand, I think this one is perhaps one of the most significant, especially today, and one we all must be conscious of, and again, which our Benot Mitzvah referred to. Because as we witness the raging forces of nature being unleashed in ways more ferociously probably than any of us can ever remember in our lifetime, I think often of this teaching, of this story, and of our obligation to care for the world that has been entrusted to us. The recorded rise in the temperature in the atmosphere and oceans around the world may well be the result of human actions, of pollution, and of our disregard for the environment, of our not doing what God told us to do. It could well be a major contributing factor causing the intensity of hurricanes and other natural phenomena on our planet. So let us take the message of this week's Torah reading to heart. Let us each do our part, for we, like Adam, were created in the image of God so that we could be God's partner in creation, so that we could see to it that our responsibility is lishmor, is to protect the world, its environment, for future generations. May we live our lives in accordance with the teaching of our sages and protect it, and let us say, Amen.